Stir up, we beseech thee, the wills of thy people, O Lord, that they plenteously bring forth the fruit of good works. May of thee be plenteously rewarded through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 2. All thy works with joy surround thee. Earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee. Center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountain, blooming veda, wet meadow, flashing sea, panting bird and flower, flowing mountain, call us to rejoice with thee. Well, we are <clears throat> it, looking at William Goode's <clears throat> The Doctrine of the Church of England as to the Effects of Baptism, <clears throat> published in 1850. Is the Tractarian programs already underway uh, with an appendage containing the baptismal services of, the, of Luther and the Nuremberg Cologne Liturgy, Liturgies, 1850, published in New York. Advertisement, blah, blah, blah. Scrolling through some pages here. Preface by the American editor. The appearance of the following volume work will prove, it is confidently believed, an emphatic event in the history of the theological controversy in the Church of England and in her daughter church in these United States. The subject is the effects of baptism in the case of infants. And the question not what the scriptures teach in regard to it, but what the Church of England and her various standards of doctrine teaches. <clears throat> this question, which has been contested on both sides of the Atlantic for 30 years and upwards, is here brought nearer to a settlement, if indeed it is not absolutely settled, than any other book in the field of English theology. The author seems eminently qualified for the final solution and adjustment of points which have been long debated and which by protracted discussion from unskillful hands have been perplexed and confused rather than cleared up. A case which not unfrequently occurs where on the one side prejudice warps the judgment and on the other want of information disqualifies for the exposure of sophistry. He is a divine of most accurate scholarship, the most thorough and extensive reading, and the coolest and most cautious habits of thought. He seems entirely incapable of a superficial investigation of any subject. Thoroughness characterizes every production of his pen. He never hurries to a conclusion, especially when it is complex, selects his arguments more like a judge than an advocate, and enunciates his conclusion with all the limitations which the nature of the premises demands. Mr. Good has already distinguished himself. His divine rule of faith and practice must be acknowledged even by its opponents as a monument of research and scholarship. It is very indeed observable that they have never attempted to answer it though it is the book on which those who agree in sentiment with the author rest their case more than any other. And though the standing of the author, the ability and thoroughness of the work loudly challenge or reply, as the same characteristics and circumstances belong to the volume here given, it remains to be seen and the world will look anxiously to see whether Mr. Good's opponents will treat it with the same discreet valor which has been exhibited in the former substance. <clears throat> Nor is this said in idle banter. The occasion is altogether too sacred for such a feeling. As thousands we venture to predict will have their mouths, mouth, their doubts removed by it, and will settle down in consequence in what Tractarians must deem a most serious error. 
it would seem an act of charity to disabuse the minds, if indeed they are mistaken. And certainly it would be rendering a great service to the cause of truth. A passing notice, a squib in the form of book. Oh, it would just kind of... Skipping through some of this. Let's get to the man himself. Among Episcopalians, the check of such a reference to Scripture is entirely illegitimate for the additional reason that in their church, Scripture has made the foundation of everything. Even the apostles and Nicene creeds are accepted only because it may be proved by the warrants of Scripture. I hate these editors. On and on and on he goes. Uh, editorial blards. We're, we're reading his book, not yours. <clears throat> Against the opus operatum view of, of the effects of infant baptism. Mr. Good contends with much ability. He argues from the general tone of the theology of the reformers, both in England and the continent, which he shows beyond dispute to have been what we now call Calvinistic, insisting that it unavoidably follows that they could not have held the Tractarian system upon the subject. He adduces that their express language on the topic, showing that they did not, and he argues from the intercourse and intimacy and mutual counsel and aid of the English reformers with their continental brethren, especially the reformed, the followers of Zwingli and Calvin. And again, from the similarity and to a great extent, the identity of the baptismal formularies of these several churches. He asserts that he is sustained by a succession of Protestant divines in England to the time of Laud, and that though from time to time <clears throat> on to the present, the Church of England has been less Calvinistic, yet on that subject of the following work, there has been very little change of sentiment until the rise of the new school established by Newman Fry. To prove this, he furnishes a catna of divines from the Reformation down condemnatory of the Tractarian view of baptism, a catna strong enough at any part to convince impartial men that the inseparability of the sign and the thing in that right is not the doctrine of the English church, even by usage, and irresistible, <clears throat> strong in the most important, for there embraces every man of eminence and ability or station, archbishops, Regis and the lady professors of theology in the universities, with many others down to the middle of the reign of Charles I. Against the conclusion which the author comes to in this work, we fear some may be prejudiced by the medium of proof which he employs. It may rather bar up the minds against the conviction to be told that the English reformers could not have held to any inseparable connection between the waters and the grace of baptism because they were indubitable Calvinists. But earnest and honest men should at once exercise, exorcise such prejudices from their minds. Feelings should give way to fact and preconceived opinions to truth. In the <clears throat> examination of a historical question, our likings and dislikings are impertinent intruders and should at once be refused a hearing. For the sake, however, of those whose minds are strongly set out against the system of the great Geneva reformer, it ought to be stated that Mr. Good, in employing the Calvinism of the reformers as a proof against the Tractarian doctrine of baptism, does not seek to proselytize his readers to that system. He does not even avow his own attachment to it. On the contrary, he shows that Calvinistic 
and Arminian divines may and do oppose that doctrine. So far from having any ulterior, ulterior object, he is careful to declare, I believe, that the articles were drawn up so as to admit of some latitude of interpretation in the points controverted among them, so as neither to exclude Melanchthon or Calvin. The way, therefore, seems clear on this subject, disencumbered of all impediments, growing out of the peculiarities of the two systems referred to, and the reader may fearlessly go forward. I'm going to get a content, table of contents here. Preface. I'm willing <clears throat> to a larger work which has already extended beyond the limits originally contemplated by adding here anything more than a few prefatory remarks explanatory of the subject, which to point out what doctrine the Church of England requires her ministers to hold on the subject of the effects of baptism in the case of infants. And the first question that occurs in such an investigation is, among the various shades of view that have been entertained on this point, she has selected one to the exclusion of all others to which she requires their assent, or whether it has only adopted one class of views within which the doctrine is to be found. That different shades of doctrine on this point within certain limits should be left open to us is to my mind creditable to her character as a scriptural church not seeking to blind her ministers to exact and precise determinations on such points. <clears throat> the contrary course she leaves to the Church of Council of Trent, an infallible pope. This was published in 1850 before infallibility was codified. There were <clears throat> there who they who are willing to take their faith from the dicta of one or more particular Italian bishops may be satisfied to swear by any particular view which their oracle holds for them. The Church of England rejecting all but the written word of God as the authority for faith lays down her deductions from the express declarations of that sacred word on the great truths of Christianity and the disputed points of faith on which the church at various times has been agitated. But were scriptures silent or appeared to her open to different views, there she is also. She receives even the three creeds only because she believes that they may be supported, proved by certain warrants of holy scripture. She is not therefore likely to require of her members the belief of what she does not suppose to be similarly proved. So far as she has definitely spoken, there are, there are all who have subscribed her formularies and minister in her communion are bound, so long as they remain in her service, to abide by and maintain her determinations. Rather, should I say, they are found in her communion because the anxiously believe her determinations to be right. They are vital and fundamental points on which she has spoken definitely and expressly so as to forbid the slightest deviation from one precise <clears throat> line to another. The great point in dispute in our church at the present time is this. Whether the full baptismal blessing is in the case of instance under all circumstances invariably and universally bestowed, whether, in fact, God has pledged himself whenever an infant is baptized, apart from all other considerations of every other circumstance except the mere act of baptism, that child. And though in the prosecuting the inquiry, which, which is the doctrine of our church, it's been necessary to show the theological school to which our reformers and early divines were attached in order to more fully illustrate the meaning of the formularies they drew up. 
the determinations of our church on the question at issue does not depend upon our connecting the theology of the church with one system. Men of very different schools among us have agreed in taking the negative view on the point of controversy. But certainly when the theology of our early divines is taken into account in the matter, a statement that the universal and unconditional efficacy of baptism in the case of infants is the doctrine of our church is one which carries its own condemnation on the face of it. The contrast between a such a doctrine and a theological system of our early divines reduces it to an absurdity. In the face of the testimonies produced in the following work, I am at a loss to understand what ground there is left for the maintenance of such an assertion. I have shown that the testimony of our archbishops, bishops, and divinity pro professors of our universities at and for a long period after the Reformation is wholly opposed to the notion of spiritual regeneration being always conferred upon infants in their baptism, and that they were followed at later period by divines who, though of a different school, agreed with them on the main point of the controversy. I've shown that the services of our prayer book, upon which the assertion that this is the doctrine of our church is almost wholly rested, were submitted to the judgment of Peter, Martyr, and Booser, whose sentiments were notoriously opposed to such doctrine, and that they fully approved of them with the exceptions, no way touching the point now in question. I have shown that Booser himself drew up services of a precisely similar kind, and from which our own are confessed to have been freely borrowed when holding sentiments which render it necessary for those services to be interpreted on the hypothetical principle. I have shown that the earliest in those publicized authorized expositions of our articles and catechisms support the same view. I ask then what remains wanting for the establishment of a complete and perfect proof that this doctrine is not the doctrine of our church, but on the contrary is opposed to it. And I cannot help remarking how completely the case before us proves the unfitness of liturgical forms to answer the purpose of a dogmatical standard of faith and the errors and absurdities which men might fall into when deducing doctrine inferentially from devotional phrases in the prayer book. It remains only for me to remark that <clears throat> the following work has been written and passed through the press. Okay, blah, 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 blah. He wants it to be helpful. He's Charterhouse Square, March 21, 1849. W. Good. Preface to the second edition. Nothing can be more can more fully show the weakness of the claim set up by those who call themselves high churchmen among us to the exclusive admissibility of their interpretation of the Book of Common Prayer than the fact of its contrariety to the doctrine of our reformers. To say nothing of those sentiments who drew up the book of Edward VI mm -hmm. were of what is called the Calvinistic school and that the primate who first issued and earnestly pressed the canon for subscription to the prayer book was a high Calvinist, Archbishop Whitgift, ought to silence forever the assertion that a Calvinist can without difficulty subscribe to it. And certainly it does not assert that spiritual regeneration is the universal and unconditional effect of baptism in all infants. And here lies the importance of the historical argument in elucidating the meaning of our formularies. We do not point to the Calvinism of our earlier divines as showing that a Calvinistic interpretation must be given to our formularies as identifying a denial 
of the high church doctrine as to the effects of baptism with Calvinistic views, for Arminians are found equally denying it. But we adduce the fact of the Calvinistic doctrine of those to whom we are indebted for our formularies as irrefragable evidence against the to fix upon those formularies an exclusive interpretation framed by, framed by men of a directly opposite school. Apart from any consideration of the peculiar circumstances under which the subject is now discussed, if it is supposed that the clergy can dispense God's grace and the best blessing of the gospel covenant to anybody they please in infancy, there is an end to all sound theology. The doctrines of the necessity of God's grace and provenient grace and justification by faith, as laid down in our 10th and 11th articles, are almost nullified. One effect, however, may result from the present controversy and the consequence be of great benefit if it please God to the interests of truth in our church, namely, that the minds of men will be drawn more to the importance of sound and clear views on the subject. Okay, William Good. Table of contents. Preliminary remarks to some of the earlier scholastic divines. Three, school to which our reformers and early divines belonged. Four, Doctrine of the Confessions of the Foreign Protestant Churches on the Effects of Baptism. Five, Martin Bucer, Peter Vermigli, who were placed by Cranmer at the commencement of the reign of Edward VI as the first Regis Professors of Divinity at Cambridge and Oxford on the subject Effects of Baptism. Bucer, the Doctrine of Bucer, Doctrine of Vermigli. <laughs> On the character of the works issued by public authority in the latter parts of the reign of Henry VIII on the subject of effects of baptism in infants. Seven, the doctrine of our leading reformers and divines during the reigns of Edward VI, Elizabeth, and James I. During the reign of Edward VI, Testimonies of Catechism, Bishop Ridley, Latimer, Hooper, Bradford, Philpott, Coverdale, Thomas Beacon, Dean Turner, Lancelot Ridley, John Old, Roger Hutchinson, Short Catechism, Reigns of James I, Testimonies, Bishop Jewell, Dean Knoll, Bullinger's Decades, Testimony of the Archbishops of Canterbury and York, Regis and Margaret Professors of Divinity at Cambridge, Whitgift, Sandys, Abbott, Prido, Westphal, Phelan, Calfhill, Benefield, Dr. Whitaker, Bishop Davenant, testimonies of other bishops, Guest, Alley, Cooper, Babington, Bridges, Barlow, Andrews, Perry, Lake, Clarence, Carlton, Downham, Usher, Battle, testimonies of learned divines and laymen. Haddon, Sum, Prime, Falk, Hooker, Willett, Rogers, or Chancellor Bacon. The Doctrine of the 39 Articles in the Book of Homilies on the subject of this work. 39 Articles in the Homilies. Chapter 9, the Book of Common Prayer. Examination of the Baptismal Service. Judgment of Booser and Martyr on the Baptismal Service. Luther's service for infant baptism similar to ours and understood by him in the hypothetical sense. The meaning of the baptismal service demonstrated by a comparison of it to a similar formula drawn up by Bucer himself to be freely borrowed. Doctrine of the Catechism on this subject. Savoy Conference. Testimony of Divine since the Restoration, chiefly the Arminian school on this subject, with Nicholson, Taylor, Hopkins, Pearson, the Arminian school, Durrell, Faulkner, Bishop Burnett, and Tillotson, Sharp, Williams, Burkett, Bray, Wilson, Beveridge, an Arminian. I've been wondering about it. 
Thomas Stackhouse, Secker, Horsley Barrington, concluding remarks. Chapter 1. The remarks contained in the following pages are intentionally confined to the discussion of the question, what is the doctrine of the Church of England as to the effects of baptism in the case of infants? In treating this subject, I shall argue it quite independently of further question <clears throat> whether the 39 articles are or are not the supreme standard of faith and test of orthodoxy and shall endeavor to show the sense of our formularies, both from internal and external testimony. Before I proceed, however, to the regular discussion of the subject, I would offer a few preliminary remarks tending to illustrate the real character of the question and how far a definite and certain solution of it can be expected. It appears to me that erroneous views are often entertained on this point, the matter is often spoken of as if the Church of England must. Is everybody okay? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Must of necessity have laid down and had in fact laid down a certain definite, precise view of the subject and peremptorily enjoined it upon all her ministers for their acceptance. In my humble apprehension, such a notion is entirely opposed to fact, and also to the well-known principles on which our reformers <clears throat> were guided in drawing up the formularies of our church, as our reformers have not bound us to one precise human system of theology. How about one human system of praying? William. You have bound the nation to one precise prayer book, William. Verse 3 of Hymn 376. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed, wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us too. The joy divine. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.